Boom. All right, cool. I clicked recording. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Vogel in the house. What's up, bro? <laughs> I'm literally in my house. Yep. I can see you, dude. Um, like I said, before we start recording, thank you so much for being down to do this. I wanted to start off the show talking about how, as a person, we don't know each other personally, but I really admire you because just because of the fact that I really admire the DIY attitude and always doing things yourself and making shit happen by any means necessary. And I'm constantly inspired by people who, whether they're artists or whatever it is they're doing, people who run their own, like, I guess, small business or their own thing, similar to like how you have terror as your thing and you just make it happen. And there's no set way. There's no uh, like structure of like, all right, go to school for two years and then do this and then terror will work. It's just like, you're making it happen the way you do. And I really admire that. And you're one of the few people relatively in the hardcore scene who's able to make a living off of, off of a band. And I wanted to talk about how did you, how did you make that happen? And when, when did you, when, I mean, when you started the band, you didn't think that that's what was going to happen, right? No, uh, I had a question. That's a, that's a great question, but should I put headphones in? Would that sound better for you guys? Or no, just... it's good. It's perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, when Terror started, uh, we we did kind of have a discussion of being a full-time band. Like, we all said, all right, fuck it. We're going to fuck our jobs, fuck everything. We're going to go for it. But it was never fuck our jobs because this is our m job to make money. It was just like, we don't care about anything else. We had all been in other bands that broke up for whatever reason let's put everything into this and for a long you know when Tara started I was living in a uh, studio apartment in a, a really shitty studio apartment that was really cheap because that's all I could afford we did years and years of touring where we would make a hundred to two hundred dollars a show mm -hmm. and this is on tour where you're paying for your van your gas um everything else and pretty much we just had to go into that being like a one way or another it's all, it's going to work out and b really give it all and hope that people want to buy a t-shirt or pe people want to buy the demo or whatever we had so merch was a big deal um monetarily for us to get by and then slowly but surely you make a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more and you're right it really is you know, saying a hardcore band's a business is kind of a taboo, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You're not yeah. supposed to think like that, but we have, you know, five members and and people in Terror do do other things. Like our guitarist Martin, he's got a he's got a full time job doing like computer graphic shit. So that's really cool fit for him and his job's cool enough when he's on tour that he can do it from there. Nick records bands and does a lot of stuff with music. So that works. And, you know, we all have our little side hustles because we're not getting rich over here, but mm. it is basically five people living off the band, which is really hard to do for a, you know, we don't have really any gimmick. We don't have like a, a look. We're not like a legendary New York band. We just work really hard and make sure, you know, merch does still help a lot of people support us, by, especially now mm -hmm. that we can't play any fucking shows. Merch is really a big deal. So it's a grind. It drives me crazy. Uh, I've lost a lot. I've beaten my body up a lot. You know, you lose relationships and you miss shit with your family. And there, there were times when we would tour nine months out of the year, which to me, is fucking insane like now thinking back to it it's like we were crazy but that's what we had to do to to make shit happen so what doesn't what does it necessarily take uh say that there's a i know people don't this isn't like a thing that people necessarily do but you know so weird I, my cat is like bothering like not yeah. bothering all over me i was gonna pick him up and bring him in the camera and then that just happened that's so weird. <laughs> Now going into the litter box, so I'm not going to pick them up right now. That's here. the second time that's happened. The first one was with uh, Jay Petta from Mind Force. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Your cat or his cat? No, it was mine. It was mine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, what do, you, what do you think it takes? Because, you know, you produce music that comes from the heart and the soul. But then after that, it's like, 
how do you turn this into some sort of capital where you can really do what you love for a living, which is really crucial for happiness? I mean, I think first thing is you got to not think that you're going to make money off of it. Because if you start to plan your moves off of money, people are going to see through that and, mm -hmm. and know that you're like, yeah. got this strategy or this merch line or... If you think about it like that, I, I mean, I can't say it won't work, but I, I think for a, a hardcore band, most people would see through that. Mm -hmm. I know there's these bands, maybe more in the warp tour scene, whatever that is, that kind of like metal core scene. Yeah. I think there are some bands that maybe get put together by a man. And, and this isn't, this is far and few in between, but I have heard stories of people, of bands that are like put together by a manager and right off the bat, they've got a, a manager, a booking agent, a serious label interest by like bigger labels. And I guess sometimes that really works because you're probably like super professional. All you think about is your band. You practice a lot and, and get really good right off the bat. But I think for kind of our world, it's just all kind of just drive. Just like I said, I don't know a lot of people or bands and at times I didn't want to do it that uh, can um, tour nine, nine months out of a year. And we're talking sleeping on people's floors, sleeping in the van overnight, not showering, no backstage, no money, eating like shit, arguing with each other. It's just, it's a really a hard grind, but um, I think more too, it's, for me, and maybe for Tara, and I don't want to speak for the other guys in Tara because they're a little more talented than me. All I can do is fucking scream loud and act like an <laughs> idiot. But for me, I'm not so interested in a band that can uh, play their instruments really well and stuff like that. It's, I don't stare at bands and be like, wow, that bass player is really good. I, I go off an energy or a vibe or even so much lyrics. So... It might be too if you're willing to put yourself out there and and really look inside yourself and come from the heart and not just phone in some lyrics that sound like what everyone else is doing. Like uh, I think it's kind of like an individuality thing too. Hold on a second. Um, the thing kind is of it's like nine nine months out of the year is crazy because even just aside from the fact that you're sleeping on the floor i mean even when you're not sleeping on the floor you're probably sleeping in a little cot in a van or or on a seat or whatever you're not you don't get to you don't get to um i was in i was in europe right before the corona thing started and i was like in a hotel and i was in a place where there weren't really that many uh, restaurants i cook a lot for myself i couldn't cook for myself um even the grocery stores didn't like they didn't have they were really small they didn't have exactly what i wanted and i started realizing the little things that we take for granted in day-to-day -day life and i can't even imagine touring for nine months out of the year aside from just that you're not seeing your your friends like you're with your friends that you play with but like you said you probably get sick of them and you want to kill them like <laughs> you're you're not seeing your other friends you're not you're constantly bombarded by people 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 music loud you know what i mean it's all I can't imagine how that is. It's, it takes a lot of sacrifice. Yeah, too. Um, it's kind of turned me into a hermit when I get home, which I think people kind of take offensively. Like, I, I'll still go to shows because when, when there's a, a hardcore show, you know, I really, it's not kind of like I feel like I have, not, not like I'm forced to go. Like, because of course, you know, there's the support the scene thing. And it's not like something like, oh, I have to support the scene. It's my job. It's just like, I, that's the place I feel most at myself where I see my friends and I love to see new bands. So I still go to shows, but other than that, I don't do anything. I don't go to bars. I used to like going to the movie theater, but now it's like someone's kicking my chair or talking and I'd just rather watch it at my house. Mm -hmm. I used to go to sporting events sometimes, like a boxing match or a fucking hockey game mm -hmm. now i just really don't do anything i go on tour and i'm like you said i'm literally with the five people in my band constantly you go to the sh 
the, the only place you can eat is at a restaurant or a gas station. There's people there. You sit in the van, you're with people. You go to the show, there's even fucking more people. And then you go to the hotel and like, our, after 20 years of being in terror, our comfort level, what we can afford is, which is nice, I'm not complaining, but to put it in perspective, we go on tour now, we always get two hotel rooms which means three people in a room, which means two people get the beds. Because if you're weird like me, I don't want to sleep next to one of these dudes. I need my own space. I'd rather sleep on the floor. Mm -hmm. So you get in a room, you got a hotel room with two beds, three people. Someone's on the floor. It's a fight to plug your stuff in so the next day you can have some power on your phone and your fucking iPad. Someone's on the phone with someone. Someone's phone's ringing all night someone's in the bathroom taking a shit or shaving and messing it up. People are coming and going. Someone wants to go to the store at two in the morning and they open and close the door. Um, someone wants the heat on 75. Someone wants the heat on 65. It's, it's just like this constant, you never have your own space. So on tour, like literally, I'll try to take a walk every day just by myself. And that's the only, that's the hour a day I'm by myself. And so when I come home now, you know, not, not anymore because no one, everybody knows I won't do anything, but like people would ask me like, Hey, I'm having people over for the UFC fights. Do you want to come? Nope. Hey, uh, I'm uh, doing this. You want, nope, 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 nope. So I think some people take it as like, I'm a fucking pretentious asshole, but it's like, this is the only time that I ever have to myself. You got it, bro. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I like, um, you take sacrifice and that it drains a lot out of you, especially like touring, because you say that when you do perform, you try to put it all out there. You perform with passion, like all your energy, that's what you focus on. So like, whether you like it or not, it's going to take a toll on you doing that so often. And like you said, yeah, you're releasing a lot and, you know, a person can only have so much in a day and (laughs) going on those walks alone, man, that's like the ultimate balance. Like that's what uh, people say that when they're at work, like that five minute fucking bathroom break is like what they look forward to, you know, (laughs) to to get away from it all. So it's a, it's really interesting. That another, like a sad part too, of, of touring that much and we don't do it as much anymore. So this isn't such an issue, but when you're playing a seven week tour, when you're at like the middle of it, there's those days where you're like, dude, I do not want to fucking play right now at all. And it's every, it's everything you work towards is that live show getting up there. And you could be in Tokyo, you could be in Japan where you, your past self and lots of other people would die to be there and this would be a dream come true and you're literally sitting backstage like i don't want to play right now and it's totally unfair for the people that came to the show that are like have been waiting to see your band and like you know i don't want to gas tear up like we're this huge band where millions of people are waiting for us because it's not like that but there are some people there that really like your band and really really click with your lyrics and your music and they're so psyched and you're fucking in the behind the next wall being like i don't want to fucking do this and that fucking sucks but it's it's inevitable you know there's those days where you're just so fired up you can't wait to get out there and go go off but there's days where you're just like you feel off you've had a bad day you had a long drive you didn't get any sleep you're a little bit sick and you're just a little bit sick of the songs like (laughs) <laughs> playing like some of the songs that we play every night i'm like oh my god i don't want to hear this ever again what do what do you do when you're at home then if you don't when I'm you, home. yeah when you're home uh, my life at home is is pretty generic you know that i always have some like little emails or terror phone calls or figuring out merch designs or or little things like that but my days are like I can't stay up like I used to. I used to like stay up till like two or three watching TV, like wasting my brain there and then get up at 11. But now it's like, once it gets to around 12 o'clock, one o'clock, I start to fall asleep. And then I get up at like eight or nine. Uh, I usually like after this, I'm going to ride my bike, my bicycle. So I try to do that every day. 
I'll go for a walk and listen to tons of podcasts and like literally things like I was doing the laundry this morning at nine o'clock and sweeping up cat litter and just like total normal stuff. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I usually get up early and do all the stuff I have to do and then I'll eat dinner and then I just watch a lot of stupid TV. That's really it. And that, that's what makes me happy. I, mm -hmm obviously during quarantine and what's been going on it, it's getting longer and longer and a lot i i talk to a lot of people that are like you know i'm i'm not saying my life is good right now or i'm super happy but i'm not like i need to play a show tomorrow i'm st i still haven't hit that point because we tour so much for so long that i'm i'm okay with the the not i, I would love to go to a show tonight and see other bands and see people, but I'm not at that point where I'm freaking out to play a show. I'm still okay with that, but uh, I, I stay busy. Uh, yeah. It's not like I don't do anything. I just kind of, you know, to me, getting up, getting like a, a an iced coffee and going for an hour walk with a podcast, that's like, yeah, it's like the that's, little things. Cool. That's, that's what makes me happy. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of- um... An old person, you know? No, it actually, it's funny you say that. What it reminds me of is uh, Samurai when they were when, when they're in their day to day life in the day in their day to day life, they're either training for intense battle and sharpening their swords and their skills, so kind of living like one extreme kind of life. And then anytime they're not doing that, which it could be anytime they're not doing that, they're like meditating on consciousness and and composing poetry and like writing calligraphy or something it's like you need if you're doing one extreme like playing in front of hundreds of sometimes thousands of people hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people you're gonna need the other the other time where you're just like sweeping up cat litter and just breathing as you walk down the street and listen to a podcast just to have some sort of balance you know so i'm like the jizza of hardcore yes <laughs> sharpen my sword and then cat litter Yo, I was going to ask, and going back to uh, touring, you guys have been to so many countries, and I was wondering, how has that affected your mindset? Like, for example, before you um, started going to these countries and seeing the way people live, like their cultures, their foods, the way they spoke, like, what did you take from that? Like, you now, have you thought about these experiences? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's one of the most amazing things that hardcore has done for me and yeah. countless people I know and bands, like it's literally taking me around the world yeah. and I'll, I'll never take that for granted. Like I've been, to, I've been to almost everywhere. There's definitely some places that are still on the list that terror hopes to get to one day. Um, but there's two, two parts to it. The, the more most obvious part is getting to see their scene and how kids dress, dance, mute their bands, how they treat each other, you know, their, their clubs, all those things you take in and you get to see a whole different side of the, the hardcore world. But you step outside that and you get to experience food, culture, architecture, all sorts of things. And it really does open your eyes to wonderful things that I have in my life, things that I see in other places that are much worse off. But on the other hand, also people living in a way different way and that's making them much more happy and maybe less yeah. stressed that you don't see. So it's, it's a, there's so much to it. And sometimes just like I kick myself in the butt and say, stop complaining, you're about to play a hardcore show, stop crying about it. There'll be time, like Martin, our guitarist, he's notorious wherever we go, he makes the most of it. Like, he's so crazy. Like, when I'm in Japan, I, you can't read any sign. A lot of people don't speak any English. It's literally a different planet for me. Trying to take the train is like a totally hard for me. This motherfucker rented a car and took a day trip and drove around Japan. And that's just his, his thing is like almost every day he'll find something to do and go do it. And it's amazing. 
And there are some days where I'm just like, yeah, um, you know, at first, because luckily we've, we've gone back to these places. We've probably been to Europe now 20, maybe more, 20, 30 times. So there are days where I'm in Berlin, like a humongous city in Germany. And I just fucking waste the day away. So it's another, it's another time, but like going to places like so many different places we've, we've seen and taken in so much stuff and we never take it for granted. There's still a few places I want to go really badly. So. No, that's interesting how you say it, how like um, you see some places that to like maybe people in America, they think, Oh, they're poor or like they don't have much, but yet they're living simpler lives and they could be happier than, us here which we're pretty much like almost spoiled in a way you know for the majority of people and um how, what do you notice in terms of like the crowd in those places where they have less do they appreciate it more do you notice like a different vibe in like lower like low-key um cities or like places like that um i think the people that appreciate it the most not in that economic uh standpoint are the people that don't get hardcore shows constantly. I think when you, you know, you know it's your only, ch maybe your only chance to ever see this band and you haven't seen a band, a hardcore band in months and months and months, those are the people that are overly excited. I mean, I think too, something, something to be said on certain countries that maybe have more and are very plugged in with technology you can see the style of dress and the way people go off to bands and people's bands maybe somewhat mimics american bands but some of these countries when you get farther out they kind of don't see every day what american bands are all about so they kind of develop their own style which is super cool you know i think that's a really cool thing they're you know they're somewhat plugged in i think every hardcore kid everywhere knows who agnostic front and sick of it all are but they might not know the up uh, you know for better or for worse the united states is very trendy things come and go bands have a style bands sound similar things come and things go so maybe you go farther off the grid and people aren't really hip to that newest trend so they don't even know what it is so they're doing their own thing which is kind of cool ever thought about uh moving out of america seeing as you've been to you just said europe 20 30 times that's nuts to me i've been to europe probably two or three times 20 or 30 that's crazy we, you, you, we usually go two or three times a year so and we, we we've been there a lot a fucking lot mm. You ever thought about moving out of America or seeing out a place like being like, damn, I really wish like I would like to live here. It's funny because our guitarist Jordan is known for lots of places being like walking around. Like, mm, I could really see myself living here. Like that's his thing. Um, you know, it, it weighs in my brain, but, uh, yeah, there hasn't been a place where I said I want to move here. So um, I did at one point uh, live for maybe a month in uh, Germany with my friend Rob. So I spent that long there. Um, but no, never, never a place where maybe it's just the uh, fear of such a drastic move of like, you know, I moved from Buffalo, New York to California. So that was pretty much as far as you can go in the U.S. But going to another continent might be uh, too crazy for me. Why, why did you move from Buffalo to California? <laughs> uh, at the time, I was uh, dating a girl and we just decided to move to California. She was in Chicago. I was in Buffalo. And then and I, I'm never doing another fucking band again. I was done with bands. Mm -hmm. And I got this phone call that terror was, it wasn't terror yet. A new band was starting with people that I couldn't turn down. So here we are 19 years later. What do you think, what do you think you would have been if it wasn't for hardcore music and having terror around as the main thing that you do? 
I've been asked that a lot. I don't know. I don't fucking know, man. I mean, I literally like when I was like younger, like sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I really cared about sports. I played lots of sports, tons of sports. And then I, um, I lived with my mom at the time. Then my mom moved to Texas. So I moved in with my dad who, uh, my dad and my stepbrother and he was into like punk stuff and got me like interested at that time I was listening to like glam shit like uh like uh Motley Crue and shit like that as well as like ACDC and Iron Maiden so obviously I really liked like it was all heavy shit as well as hip-hop I was into like hip-hop like UTFO and Run DMC before anything but then when I moved in with my brother and he was into like underground stuff, he got me on that track. And then we both started smoking weed and we got on that track. And then I didn't care about, then we went to our first hardcore show and I didn't care about sports at all anymore. My life revolved around getting to shows, whatever way I had to get there. I didn't have a license, whatever way I had to get to a show, whatever lie I had to tell my job, my parents, whatever it took to get to a show. And then eventually we started a band and it was just band shit. And I never cared about anything else. My jobs were like washing dishes, uh, making pizza, driving a taxi cab. Like I never had telemarketing, like the most generic jobs that would take anybody. So I never really had this like nothing. I just cared about music and it, and like my, my old bands, like my first band Slugfest broke up as soon as we, we put out like a pretty good seven inch, broke up. Despair, we put out a couple records and started to get some momentum, broke up. Buried Alive, we put out a, a pretty good album, got some momentum, broke up. So at that point I was like, I'm fucking done with this. And I don't, I don't know what I would have done. And I was just like sick of all my bands breaking up and like, being friends with these people and living in a van with them. And then a year later, we, none of us talked to each other cause we couldn't handle each other's or my fucking attitude problem. And I was just done with it. And then somehow I got this phone call. Like, um, basically what I'm going as for is I don't fucking know. I don't know. Do you think you would, um, you would work a nine to five or you would find like a do it yourself project that you could fund your life? Man, at this point, I couldn't see myself doing something normal. And even if I like sucked it up and put on the normal face in my mind the whole time, I'd just be thinking weird shit about weird stuff, weird, <laughs> weird movies, weird music, weird friends I have. I mean, if, if you look at me, like, you know, I could get by as a pretty normal person, <laughs> but I mean, lots of people tell me I'm so fucking weird and I'm the weirdest person in terror and I'm weird. So like I, I could, I could put on the face, but there's no way I could just, it's, I'm too far gone. Like there's no way I could just do think, this nine to five typical thing. Yeah. I think a lot of people that work nine to fives, they kind of just like, after a while, you just become numb to that, you know? And, um, you just start living this routine that kind of drains that do it yourself attitude. Like you don't, you don't start thinking about creating something for yourself or like a lot of people don't even have hobbies. Like I work in a, like labor, like construction and these people just go home. They just watch TV. Like they just eat some shit and like they do it the next day and the next day and the next day. And they don't, they just do this and they look forward to like retirement or their pension. You know, it's kind of like they don't you have know what? for themselves, you know? The fucked up thing about that is I think about that all the time and think, cause I'm, I'm very stressed. I'm like high stressed, uh, being in a full-time hardcore band where pe you need to make money is not easy. So I'm constantly thinking about the next move, merch designs. Uh, we gotta, we gotta make sure we're on tour, making some money. Oh, this festival, should we do this? Should we do that? Should we go to Europe? Oh, Japan wrote it. It's like a million things. So it's super stressful. And the payoff is wonderful. I've traveled the world. I haven't had to work for anybody, but the downside is I'm stressed all the time. I've really beaten my body up. Like I'm physically fucked up. All the stuff we talked about, 
So there is part of me that thinks what you just described would be amazing. You clock in, you fucking do your work, you clock out and you're done. You have every night to yourself. You don't have to think of, you know, obviously you have some other stresses, but you don't have to think about a million things. Your weekends are yours. You get a vacation every year. So there's that part of me that never experienced that. And it's always like the grass is greener. I'm sure if I did that for five years, I'd be like, put me back on tour, please. Yeah. I mean, it's probably, it's, it's probably scary. Um, you're your own boss, you know, there's no one who has your back in a sense. There's no company that has your back. If, if it all falls through, you're responsible for your own thing. There's no like, we'll offer you this, this, and this, you get this, this, and this. It's like, you're going to get offered what you offer yourself. Yeah. And like, I've got no retirement plan. Mm -hmm. Will I have health insurance? Who's going to wipe my butthole when I can't get to it myself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, uh, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I've done podcasts and stuff and got asked a lot about what it would be like if I never found hardcore, what's my future plans. And I'm just like, I don't fucking know. And just like with terror, with, when we're starting out and, and going on a seven week tour where we're getting $150 a night and the math makes no sense. It's just, <laughs> let, let's go fucking do it. And it, yeah. it's one way or another, it's going to work out and it's got me here. So, mm -hmm. that's, so that's, he's, the math makes no sense. That's probably uh, no sense. And I know that you kind of messed up your back or was messed up before through living the way you've been living with touring for years on end and all that. And, I heard that you did uh, some surgery at first, and then you also did some ozone stem cell uh, therapy. Who told you that? Or you I heard thought, me? I did on a, I do my homework. Okay. And um, you want me to tell you about that? Well, yeah, I just wanted to say that real quick. It's pretty insane that they can take ozone and make it a medicine, seeing as it's like, it's just a compound that's in our, it's, it's, it's in our fucking stratosphere, and they take it whether they either take it from the atmosphere or they make it wherever they make it and they, inje they can inject it into you and it can be a medicine. That's, that's just something I wanted to get out there. That's fucking crazy. Yeah. The only place I could find to do that. So I've got a lot of fucked up uh, bulging discs in my uh, neck and lower back just from hardcore, just going off on stage and sleeping and, eating like shit and being a drunk and mostly just if you will ever seen me on stage, I'm not the most calm person, but, um, over time I just really beat myself up and, um, I did a surgery on my neck and it was terrible. It was the a terrible, I wish I never did it. So after that, I started looking into like alternative things like you uh, mentioned, and I found a clinic in Mexico. I live in Los Angeles, so I'm not too far from Tijuana. And they have a lot of stuff they will do there that they don't do in the United States. So I went there and I lived in um, outside of Tijuana at a, like, it's, it's a clinic that you pay for. They put you up in a hotel and I went there for two different sessions. So maybe six weeks total where I would get injections of uh, stem cells and ozone injections, which is, it's just like a air, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. And what they do is they inject it in the disc. It's because a bulging disc is like your disc is like this and it, it bulges out, so it's bigger. Injecting it with the ozone is supposed to shrink it back up because some properties in it shrink it or they put it around the disc and shrink it. And it was pretty fucking crazy, man. Um, <laughs> I don't know a lot of people that did shit like that. It, it was pretty wild. And honestly, staying at this place, there was people dealing with things a lot. There was a lot of people there with cancer, uh, Lyme disease, like a lot of things worse off than me. Because worst case, you know, I, I can't jump around on stage and maybe I'm a little immobile, but these people are dying and I'm spending weeks with these people and again another real eye-opening experience and um again seeing like what we're talking about traveling different governments to let other things happen uh medically uh, like you know you go you go to over the mexico border and there's pharmacies everywhere because they sell tons of stuff that 
isn't allowed in the US and I'm sure there's a lot of people that could debate the good and bad of this and I'm not claiming to be an expert but it's one of those eye-opening things that you literally walk a hundred feet and it's not a different world but there's yeah. so much difference going on in so many different ways so that was a whole nother experience that was fucking really wild for me how did you find out how did you find out about the stem cell ozone therapy especially in, in mexico did you know was it google like what you do i'm trying to think uh, this was pro a good eight years ago i'm guessing um i feel like the good old internet just searching um different things somehow i found out about the, the ozone therapy and if I, this is this could be wrong but i found out about the ozone therapy there was no one in the u.s that did it but just by google searching it i remember i found um it wasn't a podcast but it was like a a, a radio interview the of the lady that owned the clinic talking about some of the stuff she did and she brought up um herniated discs and what they do for it and somehow i got a hold of her and she said let's do it i mean she said give me some money and let's do it but <laughs> we did it they don't care about insurance they don't care like what do they how do they do it any and i have pretty good insurance but they don't take anything like that really which is another crazy thing like um you know, luckily through a longer story, I have pretty good health insurance that I pay $240, $35 a month for. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that aren't covered. It's like, it's all just fucked up. This world is fucked up. Yeah, that segues perfectly into what I wanted to talk about, which was the album Total Retaliation. And you said in another episode that the artwork was meant to invoke rage in the face of the ills of modern society and how the world is chaos and you can only blame human beings really. And it's funny because by like the way that your face looks, you look like someone who's pretty, <laughs> who's, you look at peace. You look like, and you say you have a lot of stress and I'm not saying that you don't, but just like, you just seem like a, you feel, you seem like a happy, peaceful person. So it's hearing that and, you know, what's going on in your head to be singing these songs. What do you think uh, could cure the world of the greed and the madness that is, that's going on right now? Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, undoubtedly, I can't remember exactly what you just said I said, mm -hmm. but I think the gist of it is, humanity's to blame for why this world's so fucked up is that is that correct yeah yeah okay i mean what else could it be it, are the the trees outside causing the madness or the birds flying around i mean i think uh we're all given life and i think the way human beings are greedy ego driven full of lust tempted by so many awesome things in this world reese's peanut butter cups are the greatest tasting things in the world as a human being you could eat 100 a day mm -hmm. if you did that you're gonna have some fucking real problems but you're constantly tempted by all these amazing things that you know are bad for you mm -hmm. you can lie all you want there's you 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 have the availability to be a terrible person. And I don't think all, you know, obviously everyone does bad and we all make mistakes and we all do fucked up things and we all grab things and say, I know doing this is going to hurt somebody, but I'm going to do it anyways. But I think as time's gone on and on, we've just become worse and worse and worse. And it's kept, like, Look at like climate change. It's all catching up to us. Look at the state of the world right now. It's just all blowing up in our face. Like before things were maybe bad, bad, bad. Now we're just at the uh, pinnacle, pinnacle time when things are just really, really bad. And it's, it's, it's everybody and it's no one. I mean, Maybe some wonderful, peaceful monk can be immune from this conversation, but we all do some terrible things. And 
it's going to catch up. Even, you know, small lies catch up to you. When you fuck millions of people over, over and over again, it's eventually going to catch up. And I think that's where we are. And yeah, it's all, it's all human beings fault. Who else, who else's fault, fault could it be? You, you have the choice to be good to people and do good things and help people. Or you have the choice to be a piece of shit. And I know I lie somewhere in the middle where lots of times I choose the bad. Luckily, I do have a conscience and do the good things sometimes. But there are some people that all they want is to have lots of money, lots of power, and they don't care who gets in their way. And then, you know, and when you have nothing, when you've been pushed down for so long, you can fucking break someone's car door open and take the, the couple dollars of change you see, you're going to start doing stuff like that. Cause you fucking have nothing. And some, so many people have everything and you're just like, fuck you. Yeah, and the more so, like evil you commit, the more, the less remorse you have, the less regret you have, the more you're able to keep doing those things. But I wanted to talk about how in um, 2018 you did an interview and the person asked oh, you, shit. what keeps you guys you got a lot of dirt on me. <laughs> someone asked you uh what keeps you motivated and pissed off in terms of like writing your music and uh you said that humanity is sick greed is rampant and the u.s is laughable and things are getting worse and that was in 2018 so i would think that like as the years go on it's very relative it's nothing's changed it's not getting any better like you said so man what do you what do you think what do you think is going to happen in the future do we have hope like are we too far gone in all this yeah. Um, if you look at terror records, a lot of them have like angry songs and personally angry songs, but a lot of them have these like, like overcome. It's going to be okay. Keep going. Uh, one with the underdogs, uh, whatever. They're, they're mixed in there. The total retaliation is about 90% angry, pissed off because there's just, then and now even more there's just there isn't much good to look of, of course like you know some of my friends are having beautiful healthy babies you 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 have those times like uh you go for a walk and you feel great and the air is great and, and stuff like that but it's just getting hard to find those moments so i can't answer your question i i i we're we're currently writing stuff for our next record and I'm currently making it a point to make sure that we try to put some hope in it because more than ever, it could be, I said last time was 90% pissed off. This could be 110% pissed off, but maybe you gotta hang on to a little bit of hope somehow, or you're going to fucking go off the deep end. Mm -hmm. But to answer your question, I don't know. And it's crazy because the Washington Post, did you see that? They just put out that. Did you see the Washington Post? Um, they put out that world clock of how much time we have left. <laughs> no, don't tell me. Oh, you um, didn't see it? All humanity. Okay, so let me just pull it up real, real fast because I need to, I want to, yo, you're going to bug out, honestly. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so basically it's in Union Square, 14th Street. And um, it's just a, yeah, I don't know if you can see this. Do you see how it's like a, a digital clock on the top of in a building? This is a countdown to fucking oblivion? Yeah, so it says a new digital clock unveiled in Manhattan's Union Square over the weekend. Promise to tell you exactly how long the world has left to act before an irreversible climate emergency alters human existence. The climate clock, blah, blah, blah. There are seven years, 101 days, 17 hours, 29 minutes, and 22 seconds until Earth's carbon budget is depleted based on current emission rates. A total depletion would thrust the world into further turmoil and suffering through more flooding, more wildfires, worsening famine, and extensive human displacement. The timer counts down how long it will take for the world to burn through its carbon budget if swift action isn't taken to keep warming under 1.5 degrees Celsius. If Earth's temperature increases by 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, there will be extreme heat waves, fires, droughts, and limited water availability, a 2019 NASA report on global climate change warns. Blah, blah, blah. But that's pretty much, um, that's crazy. Seven, you said seven years, right? 
Seven years, 101 days. Well, by now it's like seven years and 99 days or something like that. And if the almighty Donald Trump wins, we can kiss four more of getting some change right here done. Yeah, it's a, it's a big problem, man. I don't know. Um, and you, the first thing I think about that is I just said some of my friends are having like beautiful babies. My brother has two daughters. Like I don't have any kids and reality is what do I got maybe 20 years left on this earth. Mm -hmm. So I'll be gone, but that's like the next generation is going to be severely affected. That's extremely scary. Yeah. It's just all intertwined in money because we do have, I was just talking to my friend the, uh, yesterday, last night, we do have the technology to do a bunch of things we could um, in essence, take all the cars off the road and just rely heavily on advanced public transportation. We do have the ability to have cars running on water or hydrogen, whatever it is they do. We do have the ability to do this, that, and the third, but there's too many systems in place of like, oh, but what about Honda or Mercedes? Where are they going to make their money? Or like, oh, but we can't possibly like dismantle the establishment of, um, I don't know, what, whatever, like anything that's going on right now that is clearly not going to help us in the long run. How could we dismantle that? It's like, it's just all about the money and the systems in place. And it's really crazy because first, that's something so minuscule in comparison to the greater picture of everything that's going down. That, there's a fucking clock on Union Square. That's hundreds and thousands of people every minute see that shit. It's a big fucking deal. Can you imagine too telling humans they can't have a car anymore they have to take public transportation people that are so used to that would be so offended well all i see is like yeah they built this clock and they're telling us something so important they're giving us a warning yet people are definitely walking past that like taking selfies and stupid ass videos like <laughs> not, even, not even caring about like what the fuck is really happening you know that's the real problem i think people are so oblivious until it slaps them in the face but with something like this it's going to be too late until it really hits the person. You know what I mean? It's going to be like, it's going to be over. It's going to be like a tsunami and you're not even going to have time to like overreact. You know? And I'm sure <laughs> once that clock was posted, everybody that's making their money found someone to write an article to debunk that. So everyone thinks it's just bullshit. So just keep everybody. It's not true. Well, you can, you can literally debunk anything with enough, internet honestly like right. if i type in right now i don't even know like i met some guy one time who told me i was he just told me that like eat, drinking water is not good for you and actually humans aren't supposed to drink water and he like for, thoroughly believed this and he like he looked up his little sources online and it's like but if you type in like why drinking water isn't good for you something somewhere right. will come up right so it's like you know, we have a lot of we have a lot of uh connection and a lot of uh, technology to look up a bunch of the things we want but also anyone can post anything how old are you guys i'm 24 yeah same yeah and you both live in new york city yes yeah i live in uh brooklyn when when dan seeley was on your show did he talk about touring with terror at all no we didn't talk about touring you know what's funny we barely talked about king nine to be honest with you because he, he was our roadie for a couple of years. Like, he toured with us for a couple of years. Oh, sick. Yeah, I was, I, was super, I was super hyped that he came on. That dude, is, it was my first time meeting him. He was really cool. But, yeah, He's we just talked about, like, martial arts and a bunch of other shit like that. Then he didn't tell you how I fucking chopped him in the throat and he <laughs> went down? <laughs> nah, he didn't tell us that part. <laughs> Yo, man, um, it's been an hour. Uh, I asked all my questions. I really enjoyed this talk. Yo, thank you so much for being down to do this for us. Thank you guys for having me. It was, uh, it went quick. So yeah. you, you had my attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck with everything. And uh, I love podcasts and I've got so many on my little um, list, but I got to add yours. Because I saw you had, did you have Isaac on? Yeah, we had Isaac. How was that? It was it was wild. It was hilarious. I was laughing so he, hard the whole time. He's super normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I definitely saw you guys had some people on there. That I gotta check out. So yeah. good luck with everything. Thanks for having me. Yo, Scott Vogel. Peace.